Good morning, and welcome to Burke's Worship Online. I'm Beth Sullivan, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm excited that you are able to join us today. Before we get started in worship, I want to make sure that you are aware of a few things. First, uh, this is the second week of our modified office hours while our business manager or office manager is out of town. Um, and so I want to remind you uh, that the office hours this week will be from 830 to 12. And that is when you can reach us. As usual, if you need us outside of those hours, you can find our contact information on the website. Or if you already have our cell phone number, you can just reach out. But uh, we are available, but those are the office hours hours that you can just pop in if you would like. Uh, I also want to remind you that last week we talked about the uh, Zimbabwe mission buckets. These are the cleaning buckets that we collect every year right before annual conference. And the deadline for turning those in is on the 29th. And that is a hard deadline because we have to have them checked and to the office uh, that day or the, the very soon after that. And so I want just to remind you that if you're wanting to contribute to that, you can contribute to that online and we will bulk buy items. Or if you wanted to pick up a bucket from the office with a purchase list and buy the items and turn them in, you can do either way and we will make sure that those things get where they are intended to be. And last, just a reminder that our kids' jam camp is coming up in June. It's every Wednesday in June. And so if you are interested in doing that, we would need to know how many people to plan for. So you can either sign up in our newsletter, the iBridge, that comes out every week, or you can find links online. And if you can't find that and you just need help, again, feel free to reach out to one of us during the week, and we will help you get signed up for that. Summer is coming, it is hot outside, it is a beautiful day today, and I hope it is beautiful on Sunday as well. Um, and it is exciting that you're able to join us. So turn your hearts towards God, center yourselves during this time as we uh, say the call to worship together. Alleluia, Christ is alive. Let all the people praise him. Let all creation sing with joy. Alleluia. Our first scripture reading today is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. The new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And <clears throat> I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. 
Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we come in prayer today, I would ask you to bow your heads and join me in prayer. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence today. We thank you for the ability to uh, worship together, even though we're not even in the same room. I ask, Lord, that you would speak to all of us, to me and to each person who's listening, so that we may feel your presence today, that your Holy Spirit will surround us and, and lift us up, that you will lift us through the music that is played and the uh, scriptures that are read through the sermon and through all the rest so that we may know that we are on holy ground wherever we are. We live in a world, Lord, that's filled with so many things that, that are difficult. The war in Ukraine is still rambling on and people are dying there and there are there is still disease going throughout our world and there are people dying there there are people who have uh, been overwhelmed by life and have taken their own lives through suicide or through drug abuse there are many people who've died because of violence in the world not because of a war but because of sometimes very silly things that they were angry about. And they broke out in violence against their brother or sister. And we look at all these things as they add up and we begin to think how very hard this world is. We look around in this same world and we find people that are hungry and we, we find people that are struggling. Even in a time when there is great plenty, there is still great struggling. And we want to do the things that we can to make the world a better place, to help redeem this world as Jesus promised to. So as you go about creating newness throughout the world, please, we pray, create some newness in us. Some newness that will help us to have hope. Some newness that will help us to have courage. Some newness that will help us to love even in the face of hatred. Because that's what you have called us to do. And as we pray these things, we also pray the words that, that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you will join me in these words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human 
For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we come to a time of offering, I want to say thank you for what you give. When a church is truly responding to the needs of the community and to the needs of its members, it grows and thrives. And we can see that in many, many ways. I'm excited about the things that we are doing and we're only able to do because you give here. I look at the schedule for the summer and I see youth trips and mission trips and jam camp and vacation Bible school and, 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 and. Endless things, men's breakfast, just lots of things. Variety of ways that this church is living out its calling in the world. But again, these things are only possible because you give here. 
And so I want to say thank you for all of the ands that you make possible here. Let us pray. God, as we give here today, as we offer of ourselves to you, we pray that it will not just be to always what was, that it will not just be to always what makes us comfortable, but that there will always be an and, something more that we can do in this community. And it's not always just give, give, give more, God. It's, it's knowing that we can meet a need and meeting it. The needs are great. And so we are thankful, God, that we can meet the needs that come before us, and we pray that we will always continue to be able to do so through our giving, of our finances, of our time, and of ourselves. So we ask that you bless what we give today, multiply it, and do more than we could do on our own together. Amen. Good morning. The scripture this morning is from Acts 11, verses 1 to 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted God, the word of God. So then Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. And at that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Peter, Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same spirit that he gave us when we believed in, Jesus, in the Lord Jesus, who was I to hinder God? When they heard it, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying this, God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Tony Collins. I'm one of the pastors here. And I've been doing a series called People Whom God Loves. This is a series looking at biblical persons whom we might find it surprising that God loves them based on Old Testament regulations and the ideas of the time. Last time, we talked about Paul, a violent, murderous person who sought out followers of the way in order to imprison them and even cause their deaths. He was supposed to be a Pharisee, trained in the ways of God. And God opened his eyes to seeing people differently. Ananias, the person whom God sent to heal Paul of his blindness, also began to see Paul differently. He was able to call the person whom he feared most, Brother Paul. 
This opened the door to their relationship growing and to Paul speaking the real word of God to the people of God in Damascus and beyond. According to Willie Jennings, uh, who wrote a book on the, uh, the book of Acts, um, he says that the book has three beginnings. The first one being the story of Pentecost, um, which we will celebrate here in a few weeks. The second one being the conversion of Paul, which we talked about last time, and the work of the apostle Peter, which we see beginning in chapter 10 and beyond. Peter is in Joppa. He's there at the house of Simon, who was a tanner. The thing of the story will not, that the story will not tell you is that he shouldn't really have been there. Tanners were looked upon like tax collectors of their day in, in Jewish society. It's not that they were all bad, but they dealt with things that people were uncomfortable with. In this case, a tanner deals with uh, dead animals. And this activity would make them unclean for periods of seven days at a time. Therefore, it was always hard to know where you stood with a tanner, whether you could be around them or whether you couldn't be around them. They were not reliable friends. But here's Peter in the house of the tanner, and he looks like he's very relaxed and, and having a good time. He was up on the roof in the afternoon. He was waiting for his evening meal, and he kind of kicks back and relaxes, and he has a vision. Not just a dream, not just one of those weird dreams that you wake up from and you remember parts of it, but a vision a time when he really, really understood what it was he was seeing and what it meant. The story is so important. It's told in chapter 10, uh, sort of in the, in the first person. Then it's told again in chapter 11, and they're almost completely identical, which is really unusual. It's the same story. He was there, and he was hungry, and a sheet was lowered from heaven, a big old bed sheet, and it was full of all these animals. There were four-legged animals, there were birds, there were snakes, there were all kinds of things, animals that were proclaimed both clean and unclean according to Jewish law at the time. Since it talks about unclean things, I'm sure there must have been a pig there. And uh, these were lowered down onto the roof. And then he heard the instructions. Get up, kill, and eat. Any of it. Peter objected. To this, he said, Lord, no, I can't do that. I've never eaten anything that was unclean ever before in my life, and I'm not going to start now. And then the vision repeats itself. The sheet is lowered, all the animals are there. Peter, get up, kill, and eat. The third time he began to hear what God was saying, and God was saying, What God has made clean you must not call profane. Three men were sent from Caesarea. They had come because their leader, Cornelius, in Caesarea had had a vision too. In his vision, he heard that there was a guy named Simon Peter who should come and tell Cornelius an important message and that he was supposed to send three people to go to the house of Simon, a tanner, and find this Simon Peter and bring him back. Cornelius is us, but not typically so. 
He's a centurion, so he's a man of war bound to the Roman state. He is the master and owner of slaves. He's a ruler and leader of men. He is what so many men and women in this world aspire to be and what so many people want to be defined as, a strong, self-sufficient person who um, looks who to the world looks like one unified, strong man. Cornelius is like an aspiration to us. He's a, a God-fearer. He is one who stands at the door of Israel and knocks, praying the prayers of God's people as though he is one following the gestures of worship and life as God people as though he is one, embodying the hopes of God's people, but without them knowing it. Cornelius is like a living contradiction. But Cornelius is a Gentile. That means he doesn't have a Jewish heritage. His parents weren't Jewish. His grandparents weren't Jewish. He, he couldn't claim to be Jewish because he's not part of them. And things have been set up in such a way to keep that uh, separation there. Laws within Judaism that referred to a neighbor didn't apply to a Gentile because they weren't neighbors. They were other than neighbors. Jewish meal purity laws were designed especially to discourage interaction between Jews and Gentile people. And we understand that. We, we do lots of things. We eat different foods because of the region of the country that we come from and and we prepare them differently even if they have the same name because of that if you could imagine that right here i had a bowl of of grits in my hand and and i ask you how do you prepare those grits do you put what do you put on them do you put butter and salt and a little pepper or do you put sugar and cream that makes a big difference. It tells us somewhat of where you are from and what your heritage is. If I brought out a slice of watermelon, which would be really nice this time of year, but it wouldn't be coming from this area, what would you put on it? Would you put salt on it? Would you put something else on it? Or would you just eat it plain? There are all kinds of examples like that, and some of those are big enough and strong enough to keep us separated from each other. But, but Jews were especially given these laws, not just for, uh, to discourage them from seeing people that were outside their, their family, so to speak, but they were designed to protect them in certain ways from slipping over into the places of impurity, slipping over into a place where maybe they will get mixed up with people who believed in idolatry or some other thing. Jews weren't supposed to eat with Gentiles. They weren't even supposed to enter their houses they certainly were not supposed to intermarry with each other because that could lead to all kinds of catastrophes. Yet here comes Peter. He's gotten with the three men that Cornelius has sent to him and they come to Cornelius' house and they go into the house. And when they go into the house, Cornelius tells his story, and then Peter starts telling them about the great love of God that is seen not just through the traditions of the Jews, but the great love of God that comes through Jesus Christ, God's only Son. 
there are lots of reasons that Cornelius would not have been compatible with what his, their understandings of faith were, speaking of the Jews and the early Christians. Yet God opened the way for them. He did it in these ways. First of all, God sent someone to hear Cornelius' story and to share the story of Jesus with his family. He came without reservation, and he didn't let anything stand in his way. When Cornelius freely listened to the story of God and God's people, he received justification and sanctification all at one time. He received justification because he, he heard about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he believed at that time that Jesus had done that to save him from his sins. And he began to see the Holy Spirit work in his life. He was so overjoyed by this good news that the Holy Spirit fell upon him. And Peter was amazed. The people that had come with Peter, I think there were six of them, they were all amazed. And, and they said to one another, if, if God has given them the Holy Spirit like he has given the Holy Spirit to us, then what's to keep us from baptizing these people? And so they did. They welcomed them into the fellowship with open arms. And then we get to the story that we heard in chapter 11. When all the people back in Jerusalem heard this story, they were, they were pretty upset. They, they said, Peter, why are you hanging out with these Gentiles? Why are you eating with them? You know you're not supposed to do that. And then Peter told the story. Yes, I heard a call from God. I went to this place. I, I talked to them about God's love for them, and God blessed them. So I baptized them. And they did an amazing thing at that point in time, because it, it, it could have been so easy for them to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what you heard or what you thought you saw, it doesn't matter because that's against the rules. They said, hmm, the Lord is doing something new. Okay. And they went forward from there. Oh, it doesn't mean it never caused any more controversy. It doesn't mean that there weren't people who didn't still need convincing later. It doesn't mean that there weren't Judaizers who followed Paul around through all of his journeys trying to undo the good work that he was doing. But there were a faithful few there who heard the story of what God was doing and they said, what God has declared clean is clean. In the book of the Revelation of St. John, in the 21st chapter, it, it's right there at the end. All the stuff in Revelations has come and gone and happened. And then we see this grand picture in chapter 21 of a new heaven and a new earth. There are a few things about that story that just really grab me. Number one, it's a whole new earth. And if you go back to Romans, you hear that Paul says that the whole creation is groaning, waiting for God to come and redeem the whole creation. And here it is. But it's not just that. It says there's a new heaven. I'm afraid some of us are not going to like the new heaven because it won't be like the one we heard about. It won't be like the one that we heard about where it had golden streets and all this. And, and we get these really funny 
feelings about what heaven's going to be like. Sometimes people take whatever they've experienced here and they say, that's just what heaven's going to be like, is, is this. So if you like to play golf, then you say, just wait till you get to heaven and see what the greens in heaven are going to be like. Or Tammy Faye Baker said years ago that, that uh, heaven was going to be like shopping with a credit card that had no limits. No, that's not what it's going to be like. I hope not. I believe and I hope that whatever you see as the best day on earth, it's going to be so overwhelmed by just an ordinary day in heaven. It will overshadow anything that you've ever seen. Also, I think one of the things in this passage that we learn is that when we see movement in the story between God and people, it's almost always God coming towards us. God coming towards us. Offering grace, direction, love, in a place we can call home. It's not about us chasing rules and regulations or, or trying to earn enough points to get in. It is about God finding us in the midst of our lives and inviting us to a fuller life. Simon the Tanner. Cornelius, the centurion, all of his family, including the children, his slaves, and his kin, were welcomed into God's household on that day. Did they understand everything? No. No, they didn't. Were all of their ideas and actions compatible with God's desires? No, I'm sure they weren't. Were they going to do everything right from that time on and forevermore? No. I'm pretty sure they didn't, though Cornelius and his family are never mentioned again in the Bible after this. But they were saved by faith. They were filled with God's Holy Spirit, and they had a chance to become new, not just to be compatible, but to be like God. The message to you today is that you don't have to wait on the Lord until you're good enough. You don't have to wait until you get all of your life together and everything is just right. You can begin right now to take the next right step towards God, towards loving God and loving your neighbor and, having, and living the way that God wants you to live. But there's nothing in your past and there's nothing in your present that disqualifies you from taking part in the household of faith. If you give your heart to God right now, God is waiting to tell you that God loves you regardless of, regardless of anything. Would you come and give your heart today to God? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved Cornelius and his family. We thank you that you have given to them 
your love in such a powerful way that it overwhelmed them with your spirit. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we come to you today, you would help us to simply offer you our heart, to ask you to change us and to help us to get stronger and to understand better and to live more rightly and to take the next good, right step towards you. Receive us, we pray, as one of the sheep of your pasture. Amen.
said the invitation to you today is to give your heart to Jesus. You don't need me to be part of that transaction because it's not really a transaction, it's a, it's a relationship. But if you need somebody to talk to you about it, if you, need, if you need somebody to pray with you or to guide you or you just want somebody to share it with and celebrate it with, then I invite you to call me at 423-842-4219. And when you do, then ask for Pastor Tony, and I'll be glad to talk with you about your relationship with Jesus. Remember, there's nothing standing in your past and nothing in your presence that can stand between you and God. I hope that you offer God your heart today and that you will realize that you are loved deeply by God. Amen.